Hey there, fighting fans, and welcome to another episode of Build the Roster, the show where we take a hypothetical fighting game and build our dream roster around it. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who has been supporting this show. We've only done a few episodes so far, but the reception has blown me away. So I just want to thank everyone out there who has watched these videos, given us a thumb up, comment, or shared us around the web. I've seen you guys doing that on Twitter, and it means so much to me. So to say thank you today, I'm going to tackle a game that people have been requesting for months now. Since this show began, I have had one game in particular that I knew everyone was looking forward to. A sequel to one of the most critically praised fighting games of all time. So today, on Build the Roster, we are going to- Oh, wait, hold up. I just saw the calendar, everyone. Um, never mind. My bad. We'll have to get to this, uh, another day. Because it's October, and being a YouTuber, I am legally prohibited from talking about anything that isn't spooky and scary. Okay, let's see, a spooky fighting game. Hmm. Omen of Sorrows? No, no, too obscure. Terradrome? No, no, there's too many legal problems around that one. Hmm, I guess Mortal Kombat has a lot of horror elements to it, and... Uh, no, no, that's too much of a stretch. Uh, man, I don't know if there's a horror and monster-themed fighting game out there. Can anyone think of a fighting game that's all about classic monsters coming together? I, I just can't... Oh! What about Darkstalkers? Am I... am I pronouncing that right? Darkstalkers? Is, is that a thing? I'm not entirely sure if Darkstalkers is a thing or not because I've been listening to Capcom for the last decade. <laughs> oh, I made myself feel bad. Yes, welcome to this very spooky edition of Build the Roster, the show where we take a hypothetical fighting game and build our dream roster around it. And when I was growing up and getting my first taste of the fighting game scene, I fell head over heels for Darkstalkers. As a kid, I was obsessed with monsters, and now there was a fighting game based around them by the same company that made Street Fighter? You could just drop me off at the arcade with a bag of quarters and I was set for the whole day because that was all I needed to hear. And over the years, the fighting game community's love for Darkstalkers has stayed strong. It's held on to that diehard fanbase that still cherishes this series. Heck, even the casual fans have expressed interest at seeing a new installment. Who doesn't love Darkstalkers? <coughs> all right, them. Yeah, despite the outspoken cries from audiences, Capcom loves to bring out that big sales chart that says, well, if you really loved it, then you would have bought Darkstalkers Resurrection, but it didn't hit our sales goal, so I guess you guys just don't want another Darkstalkers game. Ah, uh, yes, because when I think of what a good barometer for people's interest in a game is, it's how many people bought the third re-release of two of their games that came out over 20 years ago. Especially after being teased continuously with news of a possible new installment. Yes, that clearly shows whether or not a new game would sell. I'm so glad that Capcom really has their finger on the pulse of the fine game community. But my overflow of sarcasm aside, because of this cursed re-release, I'm sorry, re-re-re-release, selling below projection, Capcom has pretty much driven a stake into the heart of this franchise, cursing them to forever wander the earth as costumes, easter eggs, and occasional guest characters in other games. However, after all this time, there may finally be hope again. You see, Capcom's fighting game department for years now has been... What's the word? All right, bad. And I'm not going to get into all the reasons why, but let's just say that many people who have worked for the company over the years have said the problems pretty much all come from the top. The head of their fighting game department has, uh, let's just say had some problems, and his relationship with the rest of Capcom hasn't been... the best. But recently, Yoshinora Ono, the head of Capcom's fighting game department, stepped down to walk off into the sunset, and I will say, despite all these problems, he is the guy who gave us Street Fighter 4, which I love, 
And it was one of the games that helped to bring back the fighting game community after it had started to die down. So here's one final Shoryuken to you, Mr. Ono. Okay, now that that's out of the way, now Capcom's fighting game department has some new people in charge, and if the recent changes to Street Fighter V are any indication, changes such as fan favorite characters returning, characters from beloved franchises appearing for the first time in 20 years, or just Gil and Seth actually being fun to play, it actually looks like maybe their fighting games could be getting back on track. And also, apparently, the son of Capcom's president is a huge fan of Capcom's older franchises, and he's now got some more power in the company. He's actually got some influence in there. So for the first time in years, maybe it could happen. Maybe Darkstalkers could rise again. Or I'm just going to continue to live in denial for the next 20 years. Both work. Either way, it's Halloween. So darn it, today we're going to dig up this old franchise. Send a couple thousand volts into its neck. And we're going to build the roster for Darkstalkers 4. However, this episode is going to be a bit different. Normally, we figure out how big the roster will be, then we figure out how many returning characters we'll have, then we choose some new characters. But with all of our previous episodes, we've chosen sequels to games that were based on pre-existing properties, whether it be other video game universes or comic books, which means we had a lot of characters to choose from. But Darkstalkers isn't a huge universe. It's three games or five, depending on how you want to divide it up, and each installment of these games have pretty much used the exact same characters with a few changes and additions from one game to another. So today, in order to build this roster, we're going to have to dig deep. I'm going to have to descend into the lore dungeons of not just Darkstalkers, but Capcom itself, to find who we can add to this roster without just creating a bunch of brand new characters. Don't get me wrong, there will be brand new characters if a Darkstalkers 4 ever gets made. Characters who have never been seen in any other game. But I wanted to challenge myself to see how far I could get by just adding pre-existing characters. And believe you me, this was tough. I had to get creative. I had to watch the movies. I had to read the comics. I even considered watching that American cartoon. The Supreme Pharaoh has awakened! All hail the Imperial Pudding! There are lizards in my pants! Which I quickly realized would have been a terrible idea and a huge waste of time. Shut up, you smirking soul sucker! Point is, I dug up as many sources as I could to try and stitch together this Frankenstein of a pitch. But the first question that we have to answer, as always, is how many characters? How big is this roster going to be? Well, for Darkstalkers 4, I would want this to be a reboot for the franchise. And I don't mean a chronological reboot, where we go back to the very beginning of the games and reset the timeline. No, no, no. I mean a promotional reboot. A game that is meant to bring this franchise back into the public light in order to get people excited for this series all over again. So I looked at two of the most successful fighting game reboots ever to help figure this out. Street Fighter 4, which didn't just bring Street Fighter back, but in many ways brought 2D fighters in general back into the spotlight, and the Mortal Kombat 2011 reboot, which essentially saved that entire series. Street Fighter 4 had a starting roster of 25 characters, and Mortal Kombat 2011, not including the console exclusive character, had a roster of 27 characters. So 25 and 27 averages out to 26. Bing, bang, boom. That might be the easiest roster we've ever had to establish. So now that that's out of the way, let's get into the returning characters. Yes, you heard correct. We're taking the Smash Brothers Ultimate route and bringing everyone back. Which isn't that impressive when you consider how small the selection of characters we have to pull from is. Yeah, not including secret characters or alternate versions of characters, Darkstalkers has seen only 18 playable characters over the course of their games. And Akaris, BB Hood, Bishamon, Dimitri, Donovan, Felicia, Hisinko, Huitzel, Jetta, John Talbane, Lilith, Lord Raptor, Morgan, Pyron, QB, Rikuo, Sasquatch, and Victor. 
we could easily bring every single one of them back for this new installment and still add more characters on top. However, because I can never make anything too simple on this show, before we move on to the new characters, let's stop to examine why everyone is returning. Well, the main reason for bringing everyone back is because, as I said, this game is going to be a sort of reboot for the franchise. Not in terms of story, but more in terms of introductions. It will serve as a jumping on point for new fans because, well, yeah, it has been a while since the last new installment. Darkstalkers 3 came out 22 years ago in the West. Even the last big re-re-re-re-release, Darkstalkers Resurrection, came out seven years ago, and as I said, that pretty much just appealed to the diehard fans. People who already knew this franchise like the back of their hand. It didn't appeal to the new or casual fans. Another reason why it's not a smart idea to use that as an indicator about whether or not a new game would sell. So we're going to have to reintroduce people to the world of Darkstalkers. So I say approach this premise in the same way that Mortal Kombat 2011 and Street Fighter V approached this idea. In Mortal Kombat 2011, they took the storyline from the first three games and merged them all together in a plot involving time travel and characters having to relive these events all over again. In Street Fighter V, yes, it might have been mind-boggling that they launched that game without an arcade mode, but when they eventually did add it into the game, they didn't just give us one arcade mode based around the new game, they gave us an arcade mode based around Street Fighter 1, 2, Alpha, 3, and 4 as well, which, hey, I will never stop rolling my eyes at how this game launched without an arcade mode, but I have to admit, that was a hell of a way to make up for it. This was actually pretty impressive. So what I'm suggesting is that we have a story mode in this game, or at least a new arcade mode based around the events unfolding in Darkstalkers 4. But we would also have a history mode, which would basically be one big cinematic sequence where a character in the modern day recounts the story of the previous two Darkstalkers adventures. I say two because Darkstalkers 2, or more accurately, Night Warriors, was mostly just a retelling of the first game with Pyron once again being the big bad guy. So someone would tell the story of the Darkstalkers and how they stopped Pyron, then tell us about how this led into Jetta trying to gather souls to create a new god, and that would then bring us into the new game. Then, when you went into arcade mode, you would see an arcade ladder for each character based around the story of Darkstalkers 1, Darkstalkers 3, and a new arcade ladder based around the newest story of Darkstalkers 4. And each ladder would go into more detail about what each character did in these individual stories. In fact, we could include some artwork at the start and middle of each character's arcade ladder to help flesh out their adventure more, so that way, everyone picking up the game for the first time would know inside and out who these characters are, what they did in the previous games, and what their involvement in the new story is. And just like in Mortal Kombat 2011 and Mortal Kombat X, I would go an extra step and provide each character with two costumes at the launch of the game. One would be their classic costume, showing off how they looked in the previous trilogy, then they would also get a redesigned costume for this new story showing how they've changed over the years. But that leads us to our next question. What is the premise of this new Darkstalkers? What is the story? Well, I didn't want to come in here and just write a fanfic for a new Darkstalkers game, and luckily, I didn't have to, because this franchise has already set up what the fourth installment would be. You see, in the second game, Night Warriors, we were introduced to a hunter named Donovan a man on a quest to slay the evil creatures of the night while at the same time fighting back against his own inner demon. You see, Donovan was a Dompier, a half-human, half-vampire. When he was a child, he lost control of his demonic side and ended up slaying his entire village. Since then, he went on a quest to tame his inner monster, and along his journeys, he met a young girl named Anita who had great psychic powers. Her village called her a monster and wanted to kill her, but Donovan stepped in to save her. He could relate to this girl who was battling a darkness inside of her, but he could see that despite her blank expressions, she still possessed emotions. There was still humanity in her. So he brought her along on his quest to try and set her on the right path, and the two of them almost became a family, establishing almost a father-daughter or brother-and-sister relationship. However, towards the end of Donovan's journey, he couldn't fight his curse anymore. In Night Warriors, Donovan's last canonical appearance, it was revealed that he had been absorbing the evil of the Darkstalkers he'd slain, and now he couldn't fight it anymore. Anita witnessed the evil overtake Donovan, and this caused the curse that sealed her emotions to break as she cried for her friend. Donovan's ending then cuts ahead by 10 years as Anita has now recovered from her traumatic childhood, and Donovan... Yeah, Donovan wasn't doing too well. 
However, Donovan's story didn't end there. Well, officially it did, but there is a bit of a secret ending for him. If you got the Japanese-only Vampire the Darkstalkers collection the first time that all these games were re-released, you could do some special button commands on the select character screen to unlock a secret character, D. And D was meant to be Donovan after he gave into his evil side. After you beat the boss with D, he'll have one more match pop up, and you'll see his opponent is the grown-up Anita. As soon as the fight begins, it cuts to the end credits, and over the credits, you see Anita mourning over a grave, implying that Anita had to kill her old friend to stop his evil. This is our story for Darkstalkers 4, and the mystery narrator in the history mode, the mode that essentially just tells you the story up until now, would be the adult Anita who is thinking back on everything that has led her to this moment. Everything that has led up to Donovan becoming the new Lord of Darkness that she and the other Darkstalkers must stop. That's why we would have the classic costumes for the older characters, and we would have an excuse to play through previous arcade modes, and we would also get to make new costumes for these characters since 10 years have now passed. And I know some people might argue that there are some characters that canonically couldn't exist 10 years later, but we could still come up with something to do with them. For example, Lilith canonically merged with Morgan, meaning she doesn't really exist anymore, but she could pop up as some sort of a spirit that exists inside of Morgan's mind, kind of like Kagi for Ryu in Street Fighter V, or Pyron died in the first Darkstalkers, but you could say that a tiny ember of him survived, which spent a decade growing until he could reform into a slightly different body. Trust me, there are ways for every character to return, even if it's just as a memory or a flashback. I have seen other fighting games work with less than that. But now that we know that everyone is returning, and we know why everyone is returning, that gives us 18 characters. Meaning, we've got 8 new ones to fill in. Less than we normally have on this show, but again, considering that I had to challenge myself to pull characters from Darkstalkers and Capcom lore for this, yeah, this was still some work. However, after some effort and several hours perusing wiki pages, I was able to do it. So here are your new Darkstalkers. Let's kick things off with the two most obvious additions. D. Yes, I know some people might say I should count him as a returning character instead of as a new character, but I'm still putting him in here because A, as I said, the only way you could play him was to get a copy of a Japanese-only Darkstalkers collection, then highlight the random character box, and hit the select button nine times. Yeah, he might have existed before, but he was the most secret of secret characters. And B, he basically just played as a supercharged Donovan. But for this game, he's going to get a full redo. Remember, this is Donovan having been consumed by evil, and he would be the game's boss. So he's got to have a ton of new stuff up his sleeve, as well as some supercharged moves that are worthy of his new in-game status. He'll still be able to do some tricks with his sword, and he will be able to summon out his stands. Yes, I know they're not called stands, but someone in the comments is going to do that, so I beat you to it, so there. Except, we'd change his summons out so that they would get a demont twist to them. For example, his Ifrit sword would no longer be a big strong warrior made of flames, but a giant horned demon. His Blizzard Sword wouldn't be some beautiful spirit sending a little snowflake across the screen, but instead some creepy jagged ice monster firing out icicles. Heck, we could even change the press of death so that it would no longer be a foot coming down and stepping on someone, but would be a giant hand coming down and doing multiple hits as it squeezes you in its grip. But we'd also give him a ton of new moves, because remember, D is Donovan after giving in to his vampiric nature. He could steal your blood with his sword to regain health. He could transform into his big demon form, not for a single attack, but more of as a form change that would give him a power boost, and he could have some dashing attacks where he flies across the screen and swipes at you with his big demonic claws. And if we're including D in the game, then you can probably guess who the next character is. Anita. 
Yes, Anita will finally be getting promoted from Donovan's cheerleader in the background to actually being a playable character. As I said, this would be Anita 10 years later as she appeared at the end of D's storyline, although we could also give her a second costume based around her design in Donovan's ending in Night Warriors. And as for her powers, she would now have full control over her telekinetic and telepathic abilities. So she could have full screen grabs, force pushes, she could even have her assist move from Marvel vs. Capcom where she could pick up a bunch of random furniture and throw it across the screen. Also, and I'm probably just making assumptions here, but hey, as I said, I'm piecing together whatever I can to make this roster. There's going to be a lot of assumptions made today. But as I said, this might just be my assumption, but the hat that Anita is wearing in her modern day design kind of looks like a Capello Romano to me which is a type of hat worn by Catholic clergy. And she's holding a book, which could be a Bible, which makes me think that modern day Anita might have spent the last 10 years learning some holy magic as well. Which would make sense, I mean, her dearest friend was overtaken by darkness and classic monster myths tend to say that monsters and religion don't get along. So I could see her going to someone in a church and saying, help me figure out how to undo this. So I would love to give her some holy theme powers as well. Which would be a good idea to throw in here anyways, even if it wasn't for Anita, because it just makes sense to me that if you have 20 some odd demons and monsters running around your game, all using the powers of darkness, there should be at least one character using the power of light. So alright, D and Anita were the most obvious choices to be new characters. However, they're not the only hidden sprites running around as hidden characters in previous games. No, there's a few others that we're including next. Marionette. Yeah, now we're starting to get obscure. Marionette was another secret character in the Darkstalkers game. You could hover over the random box on the character select screen, then hit select seven times and you'd be able to play as her. However, play as her is being generous. Marionette was essentially the walking mirror match character. Whoever you fought against, Marionette would start the match off by possessing a different version of them and then you would be that character. It was a weird secret, but she's actually kind of a favorite among Darkstalkers fans, and a lot of people have asked over the years for more information on her. What exactly is her deal? What's her backstory? Well, by turning her into a full-blown character, this would give us an opportunity to finally explore that. However, we would completely change her around. She would no longer just be a walking duplication character because this is a game about monsters and other scary supernatural creatures fighting, and Marionette fits a very specific archetype in the world of monsters. The creepy living doll. Yeah, long before Chucky hit movie screens, horror stories of living dolls and puppets were passed down for generations. So let's give her moves where she can swap out her arms and limbs for blades or drills like she's got secret weapons hidden inside of her body. Have her tie her opponent up with her strings and we could still give her a reference to her old role in the game as a mirror match character as she can have a super where she possesses the opponent and stretches and contorts their body around. However, that's about as far as we would go when it comes to references to her old role in the game because we have another character coming up who also served as a mirror match character, but with a very unique twist. Shadow. Okay, little behind the scenes on this video, but I knew about Marionette. I learned about her back when Darkstalkers 3 first came out and my mind was blown. I remember thinking, oh man, there's a secret character in Darkstalkers 3? That's so cool! But I never knew about Shadow. I learned about him as I was researching this video, so my mind was kind of blown all over again. Wait, hold up. There wasn't one, but two secret characters that copy your opponent? Turns out, yeah, there were. Except Shadow was different from Marionette because whereas Marionette would copy whatever opponent she was facing, Shadow would copy whoever the last character was they defeated, which if you look at his victory animation, kind of implies that he either possessed them after being them, or he flat out consumed them and now he's just taking on their form. Now again, Shadow does fit a classic supernatural character type. 
Shadow People, which are stories that have existed forever about dark silhouette figures that exist just out of the corner of your eye. That thing that you think is sneaking up behind you, but then when you turn around, there's nothing there. So yes, he will be returning to fit that monster trope. However, with Marionette, there's a lot that you can do with creepy living dolls, so we weren't going to lean too heavily on her being a copy character. But with Shadow? Yes, you could do a lot with the idea of Shadow People. Heck, other fighting games have already done it. But as I said, it was kind of implied that Shadow was consuming the people that he just defeated, and I like that idea. I think it's a good creepy approach for a fighting game monster. So I say, treat Shadow Kind of how they treat Seth in Street Fighter V, or like Double from Skullgirls. He would be this big oozing black blob like he appears in the previous games, but when he fights, part of his big blobish mass would transform for each hit. He wouldn't copy any one character in particular, but he would steal various moves from several characters, transforming with each hit. Not fully transforming into any of these characters, but more of turning into a big black sludge version of that character. For example, his heavy punch could see him turn his entire fist into a giant John Talbane head. When he blocks, he could transform into a big gooey version of Sasquatch. He could have his lower body stretch across the floor and then have a blobbish version of Victor pop up half screen and punch the opponent with an uppercut. For their throw, they could have a dark silhouette of Felicia reach her claws and upper body out of his chest, grab the opponent, then drag them inside of his body as he bashes them around and throws them out. Again, each attack would use visual cues from the other characters, but we would take advantage of his amorphous shape to really make him unique. In fact, for their victory animation, they could swallow up the defeated foe and then turn into a black silhouette version of that character, kind of making a reference to his old victory animation from the previous games. All right, that was the last character who was playable in any way, shape, or form in a previous Darkstalkers game. Meaning now, I'm going to have to get even more creative. Kybit. Okay, if you thought those last two took some explaining, you haven't seen anything yet. Two years ago, Street Fighter V released a Darkstalkers costume pack where you could dress these characters up as your favorite Night Warriors. You could dress Chun-Li up as Morgan, Yuri as Donovan, Jury as Lilith, and you could dress Minot up as Kybit. And I remember almost the entire Darkstalkers fanbase looking at that and saying in unison, What? Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I remember hearing the name Kybet about once or twice in my entire history with this franchise, and I remember it had something to do with Anna Karis, but that was about all I knew. And I looked at Minot's costume here, and I had no idea what that was. Don't get me wrong, I like the design, but I just had no idea where that design came from. Well, to understand that, let's start off with who is Kybet. Anakaris has a few moves that involve his body coming apart, and when this happens, you can see very briefly a tiny ghostly face inside of him. Now, I always assumed when I was a kid that this was the real Anakaris. I mean, he is a mummy. All this stuff on the outside is just the bandages and the royal garbs he's wearing. His real body is probably some shriveled up ghost at this point. Turns out, nope. What you see here is Anakaris and the little ghostly figure inside is his loyal servant, Kybit. Now, there is almost no official art of Kybit, but in the few pieces I could find, he is depicted as a ghoulish spirit or a big behemoth. So where the heck did this design for Minot come from? Well, in Darkstalkers, a handful of characters have moves that transform other characters into different forms. Lord Raptor has the Hell Dunk that turns you into a basketball, Dimitri has Midnight Bliss that turns male characters into female versions, and female characters into... someone on the development team's really specific kink, and Anakaris has Pharaoh's Decoration where he turns you into your Midnight Bliss version, then he turns you into a small object. Yeah, Darkstalkers was weird. Really, really weird. So what does this have to do with Kybit? Nothing. What does it have to do with Minot's costume? Well, when you do the Pharaoh's decoration, Anakaris summons out a group of his worshippers, and this was their design. That is where this look for Kybit for Minot's costume came from. One frame of animation during his super. 
This is one of the weirdest choices for a character costume I have ever seen. However, it does exist. And Capcom came out here and pointed at that design and said, yep, that's Kybit from Darkstalkers, all right. That is totally a thing now. So if Capcom is going to say it's a thing, we should maybe make it a thing. Which means this will be the first time in fighting game history that an alternate costume won't be based on a character, but a character will be based on an alternate costume. However, as weird as this choice is, and believe me, it is weird, there is stuff we can take from the tiny microscopic amount of information that we have and turn it into some interesting moves. As I said, Kybit, or more accurately, the design that eventually became Kybit, is summoned out for the Pharaoh's decoration move, which curses the opponent. So we could have most of Kybit's moves revolve around spells or curses that do damage over time, or drain your opponent's meter, or messes with their button commands. Also, just throwing out one alternative idea, if we don't want to call this character design Kybit, even though Capcom already did call it Kybit, we do know that Anna Karis has a wife, and a Maha, and she does appear in the game as part of Anna Karis' victory animation. So, we could just say that it's her. Which honestly makes as much sense as anything else I've said about this character so far. Alright, now we've got three more slots to fill, and for this next character, I'm actually not even picking a Darkstalker, but rather a character who was nearly a Darkstalker. Amingo. Yes, many of you probably know Amingo from Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and if you don't know him from that game, then you don't know him because that's literally all he's ever been in. And you might be wondering, wait, Marvel vs. Capcom 2 was a crossover game. How can his only appearance be in a crossover game? He had to have come from somewhere so that he could be crossed over with something else. Not really. In Marvel vs. Capcom 2, there were three Capcom characters who were completely new additions. Amingo, Ruby Heart, and Sonson. However, Sonson was a relative of the previous Sonson from the video game, Sonson. I'm sure that won't get confusing at all. Ruby Heart was originally a rejected design for a character for a new installment of, guess what, Darkstalkers. Yeah, not kidding. That was confirmed by Yoshinori Ono and Seth Killian. But Amingo... Yeah, it's never been confirmed where he originally came from. But most people believe that he was also a design for an upcoming Darkstalkers game that never came to be. Which is exactly why I'm putting him in here. If he was supposed to be in a Darkstalkers game that got cancelled, let's give him a chance to live again in this game. I know some people might say, well, that's just a rumor. It was never confirmed. It's not actually real. That's true, but to quote the man who shot Liberty Valance, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Who thought we would be quoting a classic 1960s Jimmy Stewart movie in our Darkstarkers episode? Point is, it doesn't matter if the rumor is real or not. We've spent 20 years circulating that rumor around, so at this point, it's become real. Amingo was supposed to be in a canceled Darkstarkers game, and no amount of reality is going to change that. And I know some of you might be saying, so if he's in here... Does that mean Ruby Heart will be making it in as well? I mean, you're putting Amingo in here because he was rumored to be in a Darkstalkers game, but we know for a fact that Ruby Heart was definitely going to be in a Darkstalkers game. Honestly, there is a really strong case to be made for including both of them. But to me, if we load two Marvel vs. Capcom characters into this starting roster, then it no longer feels like it's going to be a new Darkstalkers game, but more of that game with the Marvel vs. Capcom characters. I think including one character is fine, but two would start to overshadow the rest of the show. However, that's just for the starting roster. I would totally include Ruby as a DLC character. Hell, if we get a second season of DLC, I'd even include Sansan. I mean, she is based on a mythological tale, which is where many of these characters come from. She would absolutely fit. But out of these three characters, I definitely think Amingo has to be our newest character because Darkstalkers can be dark and sinister and malevolent, but it can also be straight up goofy. 
In fact, the original designers of Darkstalkers even said that they looked at Looney Tunes and Tom and Jerry cartoons when designing the animation for this game because they wanted it to have that level of squash and stretch slapstick tone and vibrancy. So far, all the new characters I've included have been pretty serious. So I'm including the big lovable dancing cactus to help liven things up. Plus, he even fits pretty well in the Darkstalkers world because if you read the comics, which again, I did for this episode, you'll know that the Makai, the realm of the Darkstalkers, actually has a race of sentient green plant people. So for all those reasons and more, everyone's favorite cactus man will be returning. Now, as I said, I'm including a Mingo because even though he came from a different Capcom game, he was rumored to originally be a cut Darkstalker. But we've got two more slots. And for these final two slots, I will also be reaching into other Capcom franchises. But not because they were originally supposed to be Darkstalkers, but more because it feels like they would fit perfectly within this world. And you might wonder, why are you merging different Capcom franchises together into this fighting game? Simple! because Capcom loves to merge different franchises into their fighting games. Back when Street Fighter Alpha was released, they put Cody and Guy from Final Fight in there. Not as a secret easter egg, no, as major players in the game. And since then, Capcom has firmly stated that Final Fight and Street Fighter take place in the same world. And Sakura from Street Fighter appeared in the original Rival Schools, but for years, Capcom said, oh yeah, that's an alternate reality, they're not connected in any way. Until this year, when they came out and said that one of the Season 5 DLC characters for Street Fighter V would be Akira Kazama from Rival Schools, meaning they've now finally come out and admitted, yes, they are in the same world. But Capcom has gotten even weirder than that with Street Fighter V. They introduced a new character, Zeku, a master ninja who had started up his own clan. A lot of people instantly looked at him and said, yeah, that looks just like Strider Hear You. Then they heard the sound effect for his kick, and they said, okay, that even sounds like Strider Hear You. And then came his story mode, where he wondered what he should call his new clan. And he even threw out the idea, Striders. Yeah, Capcom came in here and said that the world of Strider Hear You is the future of the Street Fighter world. They are connected. So if Capcom can do that for Street Fighter, we're doing it for Darkstalkers as well. I've looked through the entire Capcom library to find some characters I think would be great fits for Darkstalkers, and we're going to start with the easiest one to bring in. Tessa, Tessa from Red Earth for anyone who doesn't know, Red Earth was a Capcom fighting game that's sort of a cult classic because people love the character designs, the animation was crisp, actually running on the same hardware that Street Fighter 3 would eventually run on, and featured a unique arcade ladder known as Quest Mode, where rather than fighting other characters in the game, you would pick one of the four characters and then fight eight different monsters. However, if you've never heard of this game, there's a good reason for it, because it was never ported to anything beyond the arcade. I will take this moment to once again ask Capcom to please put out a classic fighters pack that includes Red Earth, Power Stone, Rival Schools, and more, and I will once again sit here and wait for them to say no. But why am I picking a Red Earth character? Well, because out of all the Capcom fighting games, this one seems to match up with the world and tone of Darkstalkers the most. It's the one I can see most easily crossing over with it, and there's a good reason for it. The three artists who worked on Red Earth, Idayan, Daichan, and Bingus, all previously worked on Darkstalkers. In fact, there was a manga, Maleficarum, that actually crossed Darkstalkers and Red Earth over, so I'm not even the first person to have this idea. And I chose Tessa because I feel out of all the characters in that game, she's easily the most popular. I mean, she's already appeared in Super Gym Fighters, as well as the crossover game SNK vs. Capcom SBC Chaos, but also because I feel like she fits the mold of Darkstalkers the best. Red Earth was a sort of D&D style adventure, with Leo being a barbarian, Kenji being a ninja, Mai Ling being a martial artist, but Tessa was a witch. I mean, okay, yes, technically she is a sorcerologist, but come on, she's a witch. And witches are a classic monster horror archetype. Hell, it's even one of the most classic monster archetypes. And yet, shockingly enough, Darkstalkers has had vampires, werewolves, aliens, zombies, mummies, it even had a curiously attractive fish man, but it didn't have a witch. 
I know some people will say that Anita counts as a witch, but to me, she's more of like Carrie than a witch. The closest Darkstalkers has had to a classic witch is that one of them popped up for three pages in the comic. So we could use her, but we already have Tessa right here with her own complete moveset. And using her would allow us to keep a second series alive in some way, shape, or form as well. And it's not even like you would have to try that hard to make Tessa fit the design of Darkstalkers. With that giant pointy hat of hers, she already feels like an updated version of the classic witch design. She's good to go. Now there is one more slot, and as I said, we're going to grab another character from a Capcom game. But Tessa was from a fighting game, so she fit in here easily. But for this final slot, I had to look at Capcom's entire library for another possible Night Warrior. And luckily, Capcom has plenty of games that are meant to be spooky and scary and supernatural. But none of them really fit the tone of Darkstalkers. Yes, they've got Resident Evil, one of the best horror series of all time, but the tone and more importantly, the design of that world does not fit Darkstalkers at all. Devil May Cry is a bit closer in terms of attitude and characters, but if we put Dante in here, then he would totally overshadow the rest of this game. It would no longer be Darkstalkers 4, it would be Dante and his amazing friends. So if it's not Resident Evil and it's not Devil May Cry, what Capcom series did I decide to include? Haunting Ground? No. No, we will not be using anyone from Haunting Ground. I mostly just brought that up because I wanted to remind everyone that Haunting Ground exists, and it's another series that Capcom has decided to lock inside its vault forever. You know, uh, Capcom, while I'm asking you for a fighting game collection of some of your old series, maybe you could also put out there a horror game collection with some games like Haunting Ground or that old Clock Tower game that you worked on, and no? That's another big fat no? You're just going to re-release Dead Rising for the eighth time? All right, it was worth a shot. You do you, Capcom. No, for the final fighter, we are going with... Be your reward. Live and let die. Fight. Arthur from Ghost and Goblins. Yes, I'm going all the way back to the Ghost and Goblins slash Ghouls and Ghosts franchise for our final character. When you think of the world of Darkstalkers, you'll see old European towns, giant medieval castles, graveyards, all locations that fit the Ghost and Goblins franchise to a T. Same thing goes for the type of monsters that define both series. Zombies, demons, sea monsters, the type of creatures that make up the enemies in Ghosts and Goblins are the very fighters that make up the roster of Darkstalkers. Now, I know that some of you might be raising a question right now, which is that Darkstalkers is meant to exist in the modern day, and Ghosts and Goblins is set thousands of years ago in the past. Well, even though I say our fighter would be Arthur from Ghosts and Goblins, I don't necessarily mean it has to be this Arthur. Yeah, remember what I said about Zeku being the very first Strider? So they're now establishing that Strider Hiryu and Street Fighter are the same world but hundreds of years apart? Same thing here. Have our Arthur be the great 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 grandson of the original Arthur. Say that after his ancestor saved the princess, he established a secret order that would battle against the evil of the night, training these knights in order to do combat with Darkstalkers. And now thousands of years later, this new Arthur is the only surviving member carrying on the mission to fight against the Darkstalkers. In fact, maybe at one point we could show some of the past members, and one of them could be Maximo from the early 2000s Ghost and Goblin spiritual successor. And you could even tie this into some of the other Darkstalker characters. BB Hood is another Darkstalker hunter, but she's more of a hired hitman. So maybe she used to be a part of this order, but then she left because the pay was way better on her own. And as for how he'd fight, he could just copy several of Arthur's moves from Marvel vs. Capcom. Even if this character would be new and had never appeared in a previous game before, we do already have the perfect design for his combat style just sitting right there in another fighting game. In fact, if you want to do some crazy cross-promotion for this game, when Darkstalkers 4 comes out, if you include this Arthur descendant in the game, you could also release at the same time an old-school 8-bit Ghost and Goblin style game starring this new Arthur as he basically just runs across the old Ghost and Goblins map, but at the end, rather than fight a boss, 
Each stage would have a different Darkstalker that he has to slay. It'd be an amazing way to really hype up this new game, while at the same time being an additional little bit of DLC that you could sell for a nice little chunk of change, which would make Capcom very happy. But there it is. There is our build the roster on Darkstalkers 4. Will this franchise ever return? Well, I can hope, but as long as there are fans out there, as long as there are people who refuse to stop talking about the Cap God era of games, Darkstalkers will never truly die. Let us know what characters you would love to see in a new Darkstalkers game, and also let us know if you want more videos like this. Like I said, the other Build the Roster episodes were all based around fighting games using characters from other sources, not from their own previous games or lore. So, if you would like to see something like, I don't know, Street Fighter 6, or Tekken 8, or Mortal Kombat 12, then let us know that down below. And also, I'm going to give a big shout out to Nostalgia Gamer, who did a massive multi-part video series on the history of Darkstalkers and all the lore behind these characters, which really helped me out during this video. And speaking of promoting YouTube videos, if you like this video, then please share it around the web. It really does help our channel grow, as does leaving a comment and a like down below because that tells YouTube to promote our stuff. But thanks again for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe and happy Halloween.